culture that we call the death culture, that we see clearly as a society, a culture that's out to destroy itself and everything it's involved with and destroy its environment, you see? A society, a death culture, you see? You were born into that, no matter what your religion is, you see? To survive, to exist from day to day, from moment to moment, to relate to anybody, you had to relate through your conditioning, through your, through your social, political environment, you see. And I don't get a lot of opposition from anybody in any sect of any belief when I call it a death culture. What we have now is you and me, you see. What we have now is the madness. Wolf Sendick born Lawrence E. Wolfing in El Paso, Texas on October 7th, 1920, was an American author, poet, musician, environmentalist and bohemian. He described himself as an undiscovered beat. Wolfing founded the Zendik community, also known as Zendik Arts Farm, located in Florida, Southern California, Texas, North Carolina and West Virginia at various times. He ran this community with his wife and partner, Carol Merson. Once Carol had agreed to marry Wolf, she lost the C from her name and became known as Arrol. Zendik farm members were known for selling their t-shirts and bumper stickers saying stop bitching, start a revolution. The community has since disbanded, with the property being sold. It has been accused by former members of being a cult. Wolf Zendik died on June the 12th, 1999. Shortly after this, Helen Zuman would arrive at the farm and become a member of the Zendik community. We have Helen here with us today to talk a little bit about her time at the farm and her experiences living within this community. Hello everyone, I'm your speaker Casey and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. Today I am extremely pleased to welcome our guest speaker Helen Zuman. Helen is the author of the incredibly candid memoir titled Mating in Captivity, a memoir an autobiographical insight into her time within Zendik. And if you haven't heard of Zendik before, strap yourselves in, people, because this one is a wild ride. Hi, Helen, and thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been so excited to talk to you since we agreed to have this meeting. Would you like to start and just go ahead and introduce yourself and, and give everybody a little bit more information about what you're up to now and a little bit about your history? Sure. Um, my name is Helen Zuman. I'm the author of Making in Captivity, a memoir about my five years in a cult with a radical take on sex and relationships. I grew up in Brooklyn. I was actually born in London, but was only there for four months. I don't remember a thing. Grew up in Brooklyn, went to, went to Harvard for college, spent five years at Zendik Farm in North Carolina, did a bunch of traveling, ended up back in, in Brooklyn. And now I live in Beacon, New York, in the Hudson Valley with my husband. We have a homestead, a very modest homestead, but Finally, I have been able to realize my dream of growing my own food and becoming more self-reliant in a, in a healthier way. That sounds absolutely fantastic. So let's get into it. I'm really excited to explore this a little bit more. So you talked about in the middle of your journey, spending time on Zendik Farm, uh, which is, is what we're going to talk a little bit about today. So how, when and why did you find yourself at Zendik Farm? Oh, I moved there in the fall of 1999, October 26, 1999, to be precise. That was about four and a half months after I had graduated from Harvard. Before I graduated, I received a $13,500 fellowship to explore intentional communities in, in the U.S., places that grew their own food, where there was a flourishing village life, interdependence beyond the nuclear family. So I had that grant money. And why I wanted to go on this exploration 
Well, I was searching for meaning and purpose and belonging. And when I graduated from Harvard, I looked around at all the paths my classmates were taking and all the things that it was respectable for someone like me to do. And I didn't see myself. I didn't see anything that made any sense to me. I, I didn't have really an apocalyptic worldview. I just saw all these professions and occupations that were devoted to preserving business as usual. And business as usual to me seemed just on a very deep level corrupt. It seemed to be about manipulation, just exerting power over others from a distance and not about touch, not about actual, you know, human or human to animal or human to other forms of being interaction. So I set out on this exploration. I visited a bunch of communities. I went out, I went out west, I went to California. I stayed at a place in Arizona that I had been before. I kind of hopped around a bit. And then I was back in New York in Brooklyn in the fall. I hadn't found a place to settle down, which is really what I wanted. And then I found Zendik Farm in the back of the Communities Directory, which is a book that is still in print. It gets updated periodically. It's also this directory is also available on the web at ic.org, the website of the Foundation for Intentional Community. So I was looking at this book. I found the listing for Zendik. A bunch of things in the listing appealed to me. Like they said, they had the youngest average age of any community in the country, well, in the world, actually. And I had lived during my last year of college at the, in this co-op house that was kind of bohemian. It was a place for the misfits. We cooked and cleaned for ourselves and stuff. And I, I had felt like I belonged there. And, and part of my quest had to do with finding a more permanent version of this camaraderie and this belonging. So that was attractive to me. They said that they had an apprenticeship program, meaning they had a way to deal with new people. They wanted new people. And that had not been true in other places that I had gone to. And also they said that they, they did a lot of farming, but also did a lot of art. And I had majored in art in college, and I had always been interested in writing. And so it seemed, it seemed important to, to go to a place where I wouldn't have to set aside these very important parts of myself in order to fill these gaps in my practical education. So that was what attracted me initially. And then I checked out their website. They, the website was very primitive. This was only 1999, but there was an essay on there called The Big Lie, which was about how everyone is lying all the time. And I was like, fuck yeah, that is so true. <laughs> I had just seen the movie, The Matrix. And I was like, yep, living in the matrix. This is my way out. Um, so then I called, I called Zendik on the phone, talked to, talked to a member who lived there, asked some questions, got sort of hazy answers, but I didn't know to question that. And then I got on a bus from New York City to Hendersonville, North Carolina, planning to just stay for a couple of weeks and check it out. So do you, in this transitional period, not sure where you're going to go or where you're going to end up and asking sort of all these life questions, when you phone Zendik and you speak to somebody and they're giving you these vague answers at this stage, maybe appeals to you and what sounds good to you and being able to grow your own food and do music at the same time and do art and do all of these creative things that sounds like perfect for you yeah it sounded very good and one example of a question I asked that I got a hazy answer to was how does work work like who's responsible for what and I was told well nobody has a nine-to-five job here we all just do what needs to get done so it was framed in terms of a rebuke business as usual like you know out here we're, we're cool kids and we just we just do our own thing and we're not hide down like with other people now I would ask like okay but can you be more specific at the time I was like mm, sounds sounds good to me and when you get to Zendik what is your first impression when you first arrive there what what does it look like and you know how does it how does it feel in comparison to other communes that you'd been to at this point so when I first arrived, I was given a tour of the property. It was pretty primitive there at the time. The farm had just moved from Florida to North Carolina earlier that year. In, in their terms, it was still pioneer times. There was a lot of building going on. The living conditions were pretty basic. So walking around the property, I mean, I'm... 
I'm guessing that it would have it would have really felt very primitive to me. I, I the place I was shown where I was going to sleep it was in the the loft of the horse barn, and it was kind of like indoor camping more than an actual dormitory. Really, there was no insulation. It was just this barn. I actually, though, I was sleeping in an insulated box in the back of this loft with the other new people, all of whom were men, which was kind of shocking and strange to me. So that was part of my initial expression. Impression was like, okay, I'm I'm sleeping in a room with all these guys who I have never met before. That is interesting. I I was immediately struck by the people, just by how confident and intelligent and practically skilled they seem to be you know I was I was new here and you know and and there were just all all these people who who really seemed to know what they were about and what they were doing and they were mostly as advertised young and and quite attractive as well especially the guys so so that was that was exciting so you've arrived and you're you've seen all of these attractive men and you're going to be bunking in the same room as all of these men where is everybody else at this point yeah just one caveat most of the new guys were not attractive just saying so I wasn't all excited about that but okay so um so the there were a few dozen more bunks in the main part of of the horse barn most of the rank and files and the men were sleeping in the horse barn, um, along with at least one one woman who was also fairly new, not as new as me, but fairly new. Then there were a bunch of women who were sleeping upstairs in the farmhouse. The farmhouse was sort of the the nerve center. Well, in a way, in a way, it was the nerve center of the farm. It wasn't really the headquarters because that was the mobile, which was up the hill from the farmhouse. That's where. Errol, the leader, and her people lived. So that was sort of central command, the mobile. But I didn't go up there for, for quite a while. But, but the farmhouse was, was the sort of bustling hub of activity okay. for kind of everybody on the farm. So some of the women slept in a, in, a, in a room upstairs from the farmhouse. And then a bunch of people, the higher ups, slept in the mobile, which was not a super exciting house. It was a mobile home. But they were in the in the final stages of building a, a much bigger and very beautiful building called the Addition, which Errol and her people moved into uh, soon after. So Errol, um, she's the, the matriarch of the farm? Yes. And, uh, and, and prior to this, it was actually her husband that, that, that ran business? Well, they were a team, Errol and Wolf, my perception of their relationship is that she was always pretty much in charge of the practical aspects of running the farm. Okay. Whereas he was more in charge of the philosophizing and having the brilliant pot smoke inspired revelations. And But I would say that she was always kind of the driving force between keeping things together okay okay and in the uh in the addition she she's she lives there with other men and women yeah she was yeah once it was finished she moved in there with her boyfriend she had gotten involved with after wolf's death okay her boyfriend um her daughter and probably her daughter's boyfriend at the time her daughter's children yeah and there were a bunch of other people living in the addition as well Basically, um, anyone in the inner circle lived okay. in the addition, some of whom were related to Errol and some of whom were not. Okay, okay. And Swan is the biological daughter of Errol and Wolf? Yes. Okay, okay. So you're in, you're in the, the, the barn mm-hmm. with all of the newbies mm-hmm. and you're hoping to move into the farmhouse. Well, I just wanted to move into the room with the women. I just felt kind of exiled in my little insulated box with the guys. I think isolating the new people was purposeful because it gave us something to strive towards, but it also made sense. I mean, you have these random people showing up who you know very little about. Why not put them all in one place? You wouldn't necessarily want them sleeping right next to people you already know. 
So in that in that way, I think it kind of made sense. When I was reading your book, I realized that there were other ways that they did segregate the newbies as well. And one of those was through um, your eating utensils. Yeah. So when I arrived, I arrived in the evening. So the first meal I had there was dinner. And before I was able to get my food, I was told that I would be in quarantine for 10 days, which meant that I couldn't help wash the dishes or cook and that I couldn't use the utensils and plates and stuff that other people use. So I had to pick out a bowl and a plate and a knife and a fork and a spoon and put my name on each of those with masking tape. And those would be, that's what I would use for the next 10 days. And I remember thinking this was weird because I had been to a bunch of other places where people ate communally and none of them had had this practice. So I felt just a little bit like a leper. But it's explained to you in a way that that is rationalized and makes sense? Yes. Yeah, I was told this is just, this is how we do things because we live so close to each other. Any bugs anyone brings with them are liable to spread really quickly. So this is just our policy. And all of the food and drink that you have there, it's all grown on, on the farm and it's all from the property? No, we did have big gardens and we did grow a lot of food, fruits and vegetables. We also had a herd of about 60 goats. So we had a lot of goat milk. Eventually we got, we got cows and we had cow milk as well. But we also, we ordered lots of food in bulk from distributors. The food bills were probably, you know, upwards of a thousand dollars a week. So we, we, we absolutely were not self-sufficient in terms of food. And so you've, you've gone to the farm, you're in your shared dorm, you've got your own cutlery and your own plates. And I realized that on the, well, in the morning, in your first day, you're just nonstop. You did about four different things that day. Uh You went to put up some shelves and dig a trench and paint some things. (laughs) Yeah. 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 From right from the beginning, I was just thrown onto the work crews and that was that was fine with me because that was what was happening and that's where the people were and of course what was most interesting to me were the people and this was how I got to hang out with them in various different configurations so I I didn't mind I was happy to jump in. So then when you're on your first day you speak to Toba Mm -hmm. um, and the pseudonyms that the people have in the book are they chosen by you or were they chosen by the people themselves? So most people who moved to Zendik changed their names from their original names. And the names that they took, it it was a combination of sometimes the person would choose, would choose their own name. Sometimes Errol would say, your new name is this. Sometimes they would try to make a name their own and Errol would, would disapprove of it. Or they simply wouldn't be able to sell it to the group. They wouldn't be able to get people to start calling them that. I tried to change my name a number of times. It never worked. I never was never able to sell it. So I remained Helen, although I did sort of have the pen name of Hellion, which was sort of my nickname. But the pseudonyms in the book, they are all names that I I came up with myself. And generally, I just tried to keep it so that if if the per, if the person in real life had a weird Zendik name, I gave them a weird name that I made up myself. And if the person in in real life had a regular American name because I hadn't changed their name, then I gave them a different regular American name. Okay, I can definitely see that through the pattern of the book, which is really cool. I had, would have never have known that that's how it was done. So that's really interesting. So you're, you've gone on to your first days of work. You're on the work crew. You, you're, you're with one of the ladies that lives there and she's one of the older ladies on the farm. Mm-hmm. And she starts to ask you about your personal life and your relationship history. And mm-hmm. you offer part of your history to her and she seems to be very good at reading you she she makes assumptions that seem to be correct on on how much experience you've had um sexually in the past um and it and, and you offer her some information as well and it just seems like a nice casual conversation and then everybody's approaching you and this information has been relayed back to what seems like the entire farm well i don't know about the entire farm but but later, you know, later that after that day, I had a conversation with another person who who 
happened to already know that I was a virgin and who had learned it from, from the woman I had worked with in the morning. So I don't know how, how widely spread the information was. Okay. And, um, and that information is interesting because I'm at the time, um, which I'm sure you weren't aware of before you visited the farm for the first time, you'd actually walked into what turned out to be um, a sex cult. I would say definitely that Zendik is a cult. I would not say that it's a sex cult. I did choose to name my book Mating in Captivity, and I did choose to focus on the threat of sexuality because that was the most intimate form of control that was exerted over us at Zendik. However, I find the term sex cult to not be terribly useful because as far as I can see, every single cult has to deal with sexuality and has to figure out how to control it. At Heaven's Gate, it was celibacy. And in the FL, in the Fundamental Saturday Saints, they marry 50 women off to one man. And in the 12 tribes, it's all about having those 144,000 kids or whatever. But every cult has to control its member sexuality. And they can do it in a wide range of ways. So yes, the, the Zendic rituals for sex were interesting <laughs> and distinctive. But sex was also just one, one part of life. I do appreciate you being candid with me and just telling me that that's not how you would describe it or that's not how you would see it. So it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, you're just saying what your impression is and I'm responding, but it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. that. <laughs> so you, um, you've moved in, you've had your first day of work, uh, everybody has, well, a few people have approached you um, about uh, being a virgin. Um, and then you are spoken to about how the dating system works on the farm. Mm-hmm. And how, how does that, how is that conversation brought up to you and, and, and that aspect of the farm and how that works? That aspect was brought up to me in one of these situations where I was working, painting shelves with another woman who I call Zeta in the book. And she asked me if anyone had told me yet how dating worked. And I said, no, I didn't know that there was any particular way that it worked. I, when I, when I was at dinner that first night, I had, I had noticed an interaction in in which one woman asked another, are you having a date tonight? And she said, yes. And I thought, oh, they're going out to dinner in a movie. So why does that woman who's going on the date have a bowl of food in her hands? I noticed that, but I didn't really think much of it. So, so, so Zeta told me that this was how it worked, that if I was interested in a guy, then I would approach one of two dating straighters, straighter was short for administrator, and I would ask that person to, quote, hit up, we used lots of 60s lingo, this guy for a walk, either a walk, which meant just hanging out, talking, groping, kissing, whatever, or a date, which meant going to a designated date space and getting naked and having sex. The the, the person who who was going to decide whether this would happen was the the guy I was hitting up. Okay. He, He was the one with the power to say yes or no. It was just that I had to go through someone else, right. make the request. And that meant that a priori, there was no privacy. So what, what would happen if you were to ask um, somebody directly if they were to, to go on a date? That just wasn't done. It just later didn't on, though, well, well, later on, the rules changed. When I first arrived, I had to ask through one of these straighters. A little later, Errol changed the rule to require that to require everyone to hit their people up directly face to face. That became the new rule. So it it did happen then when that was the rule. And then later on, the rule changed again to, to be that you had to find a third party to do the hitting up for you, but the third party could be whoever you chose. Right. Okay. Okay. So the way that the farm works is not set in stone. It's kind of our old picks and chooses when things change and when new rules come in. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Certainly the way that we lived was, no, it was not set in stone. The farm changed a lot. It changed a ton in the many years that existed before I arrived, and it changed a lot when I lived there. Also, I just want to make a caveat about, about always having to ask through someone, because it is quite possible that in that period where the dating traders 
were were in effect that if you were kind of in a in in a relationship with someone then maybe you you were going to just set it up with that person so there that that that, that probably i think that that actually it, it did happen um but if it was a first time or if it wasn't if it wasn't someone who you were already um kind of heavily involved with then you had to go through the right through the okay thing. okay um why do you think that things were done that way well there was this idea at zendik that had been built into it from the beginning of the need for each person to be intimate not primarily with one other person but with the entire group so even though i was going on dates with just one person at a time the experience of setting up the date making the arrangements was was again was not was not private was knowable to anyone who who cared to find out and i i think it i think it it was that way partly because if you don't have privacy if you if you can't just do what you want when you want and people are watching you then there are more opportunities for intervention for control it, it created this feeling that your sexuality doesn't belong to you okay okay and uh, this sort of notion of um of of not having a relationship with one person but having a relationship with everybody was was part of the uh, philosophy that wolf was was selling to zendix yeah he he saw the 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 couple as kind of a a unit formed for defense against the death culture which was what zendik called the outside world and so his idea was to create a group where everyone was cooperating with each other such that everybody had support and didn't need to to pair up for mutual defense the end goal of the zendik dream was to take over the entire world and create this world where everyone lived the way we did and so there was no one to fight against and this this is the death culture that that wolf zendik talks about so much in in um and in, in his speeches and videos that that i've watched on on the internet um he is a very charismatic guy really i think he well me and my partner watched some of one of his speeches together and he my partner summed it up perfectly when he said he's saying a lot but he's not really saying anything at all yeah i i think some people respond to him really well and think he's awesome and other people are like wow he just smoked way too much pot but but when you first um when you first arrived at zendik were you aware of of this philosophy that that the farm had or was that introduced to you over a period of time whilst you were living in this communal space i wasn't aware of the zendik philosophy before i arrived except for that essay i mentioned about the big lie i really wasn't aware of it many people came to zendik after getting a zendik magazine on the street we went out and sold our magazines on the street to make money but i didn't find zendik that way so i didn't see the magazine until i was in a car on the way to the farm very early on very very soon after i arrived i started hearing people talk about how they were starting a revolution and i was like well what kind of revolution because you guys listen to heavy metal music and that doesn't seem very revolutionary to me that seems pretty mainstream and sold out but over time i got used to that idea we also when i was new we had about weekly philosophy classes where someone who'd been there for a few years would give us copies of essays well essays that wolf had written often these essays weren't really essays they were just transcriptions of talks but we called them essays and so we would dive into one of these essays and talk about the concepts and so on but no i i didn't really know much i didn't really i didn't i don't know that i knew that zendik had a philosophy before i arrived <laughs> it didn't bother me that that the zendik said they were starting a revolution i like i said i originally i originally had my doubts 
else about whether whether that was true or not. But it made sense to me on a basic level because I did feel like the world was really fucked up in a really fundamental way that most people were not willing or able to recognize. So when the Zendik said they were starting this new culture that was going to change everything that was going to replace lying and competition with honesty and cooperation and replace the nuclear family with this tribal way of life. I was like, heck yeah. You know, I, and I was, and I was all about digging into the basics of day-to-day life and radically revising those. And the Zendix did seem to be doing that. I don't think there was ever a point where I thought I don't want to be part of this revolution because the the revolution, what it was supposed to bring about was actually pretty great. There wasn't much to argue with in the vision of equilibrium, which was a form of governance that fully took the ecology into account. You know, who could argue with that? Also, when I was out on the street selling magazines and music and CDs and music and and bumper stickers and t-shirts, I would, like you mentioned, get these questions about what's what's the revolution. And I I kind of had to make it my own. And I would say, well, it's a revolution for truth and beauty and creativity and all these things, just pulling in my own dream of a utopian reality. And the the Zendik revolution was kind of undefined enough that I could do that. And when you're when you go out into the streets and you are selling all of this material, you called it your ammo? Yeah. Yeah, we called it our ammo. We were going out into the death culture, which was a war zone, and we were firing our ammo into the crowds. And I think I agree with you in, in terms of um, if, if somebody offered me, because um, when we spoke, you said that you don't use technology on weekends. Well, I don't. I steer clear of the internet for the most part. I don't check my email, stuff like I basically, I avoid any of the distractions the internet might visit upon me on the weekends. And I think a lot of people cr- crave that type of thing, especially, you know, in a, in, we're, we're a technologically driven age at the moment. Everything is very, um, is very now, 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 go, 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 instant gratification from, you know, social medias and, um, and, you know, not really taking a break or a step back to focus on things that do, you know, that, that, that aren't distractions and making time for family and friends. And I think, go into a community that is saying, you know, we don't have to worry about competition anymore. We don't have to worry about cosmetics and the way that we look and dyeing our hair and using makeup and, you know, going to the gym and worrying about social media. We're disconnected from all of that stuff. And I think that that sounds incredibly appealing to people in this day and age who are socially anxious and crippling shyness because they're not used to being face to face with groups of people and this lockdown is definitely not helpful. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm getting more and more socially retarded every day. Absolutely. So when you know when when somebody says to you we're going to fight the death culture, we're going to fight this competition, we're going to fight all this technology and we're going to live peacefully as a group and start this revolution. That absolutely sounds that sounds ideal to to me and you know I'm sure that my lifestyle and my life and upbringing has been completely different to to yours and your experience of living in America Mm -hmm. so when does it become something that you no longer want to be a part of or can be a part of and and how does that how does it go from being somewhere that you really want to be to somewhere that's not good for you anymore well that that took quite a long time I mean As far as being a place that wasn't good for me, it probably stopped being a place that was good for me, I don't know, within a year or a few months. But it took me a really long time to realize that. And I didn't even realize that at the time that I physically left the farm. I was kicked out of the farm. I was expelled. At the time I was expelled, I was still a true believer. 
I felt like this was the only worthwhile thing I could do with my life. And like, I was losing everything, but I didn't have much of a choice. So I left the farm, went off into the death culture, kind of expecting terrible things to happen to me, but they didn't. And I spent maybe, I spent a little more than a year just out in the world feeling on the one hand doomed and wrong. Like everything I was doing and everything I was was just wrong because I wasn't authentic and that was the one true thing. But even as I was feeling those things, I was still making my way in the world. I had to figure out how to make money. I had a, a this I, I, dream of traveling around the world and I did that and I, I had jobs and made friends and learned things and developed relationships and had crushes and love affairs and all this stuff. And, and I think very gradually, I, I was no, after a while, I just was no longer accustomed to being treated like crap because generally out in the world, people treated me respectfully and liked me and saw me as a hard worker, you know, and worth being around. So I think after that after that year or so of just being in, in these totally different social environments, I got to the point where I thought I should be ready to go back to Zendik because Zendik was still the one true thing. And I had supposedly mowed down my death culture fantasies that were protect, preventing me from fully committing. I thought I should be ready to make that call to the farm, but I just couldn't do it because I knew in my body the kind of response that I would get. I would, I would dial the number, someone would answer, I would say who I was, and they'd be like, oh, you. And they would not be interested in anything that had happened to me. They wouldn't want to hear my stories. They wouldn't really even want to know how I was doing. And to be able to get a chance to go back, I would just have to grovel and abase myself. And I just couldn't bring myself to do that. That didn't mean that I knew clearly at that moment that Zendik was not a good place for me. I still didn't fully know that because I didn't understand the pattern it was part of. But that was kind of a, a moment of bodily recognition that I... I was... I, when I was... I, I, obviously I've missed so much out, so I'm going to have to go all the way back. But um, when I was reading the book and I read the line... Um, uh, when when they tell you that you should leave and you say I think you're right I was so relieved that you'd finally and and obviously you you weren't ready for a very long time to, to not be a part of Zendik but I was so relieved when you finally agreed with them and was like yeah I think I'm gonna go and I was like yes and yeah. because oh, well we'll talk about this I guess um a little, a little bit more but um you left at one point and you went back and I was thinking oh please <laughs> Yeah, I've heard other people say about the part where I leave and come back, and they wrote, no, in the margin. <laughs> it's just thinking, oh, we're only halfway through, and she's left, and then, oh, no, she's come back. <laughs> so um, so you mentioned before that it, a thousand a week roughly for, for food, and there's around 40 members on the farm. Well, the population changed. When I first arrived, it was... I think around 60 went up to around 70 and then fell steadily for a number of years and it was about 35 by the time I left okay okay and the um the food costs a thousand dollars and you go out and you make money by selling the magazines and cds on the street we we had a variety of different selling locations one thing we would do is just go to a busy street corner in a, in a city. Um, often we would choose the street corners where the, the wealthier people would go, like to shop. And we would go to, to places where there were lots of bars, which attracted lots of foot traffic and then produced lots of drunk people at night. We often did pretty well with the drunk people. So when we were going to cities, within within the crowds of people walking by, we certainly had our filters for whom to approach. And I would say 
for me, if I possibly could, I wanted to approach people who looked a little out of place. Sometimes everyone was just, you know, perfectly coiffed and dressed and I had no choice but to approach them. But I was looking for the misfits generally. Then we also went to concerts and festivals and even protests eventually. We found that protests were, were really good for us. One of the festivals, one of the concerts we went to a lot was OzFest, which maybe is like over now. I don't know if anyone even knows what that is, but uh, you know, it was Ozzy Osbourne's this like heavy metal guy who bit the head off of a bat, you know. And so, so we, we would go to we would go to the concerts of musical acts that really spoke to young people who were deeply disaffected. That was a that was a good market for us. Um, and sometimes, yeah, and, yeah. So that that was that was part of it. And then just drunk people out having a good time people at protests. I remember also one, one year selling the string of Bruce Springsteen concerts in the New York area. It was after 9-11 and he was touring in support of his album, The Rising, which was about 9-11. And, and I remember sort of having to come up with a whole different way to talk to those particular people. I mean, in, in a way, in a way, the Zendik message had its, had its particular target, but in another way, it was pretty much adaptable to any crowd. You know, we, we, we could, we could, we could pitch it in a bunch of different ways. And how would you, that, that, that feels like that's a skill you'd have to develop, like knowing how to read people. And, um, you know, we've, we've talked about being, you know, a little bit socially shy. So how did you um, personally, did you know how to sell to people straight away? Or was it something that you had to develop? Or did you never get the hang of it? Or what was that I was, like? When I first started selling, I was utterly terrified. I, I was motivated to try it because... After I'd been at the farm a little a little while, I noticed that number one, selling trips seemed like fun. You would go off together in a van with your crew of you know two to seven people or whatever, and you'd all be together in this having this really intense experience, you know, for for a few days. And clearly, you were bonding when you were on the road and getting closer to each other. Then you came home, and if you had done well. You got a lot of praise and admiration for that. And you got to sleep late because you're totally exhausted. Also, you got to eat peanut butter and tahini when you went on road trips and you didn't get to eat those at home. So I was motivated to try it for those reasons. But the idea of going out in the street and approaching strangers and asking them for money, I mean, we were selling stuff, but basically asking for money, that was terrifying. The very first time I was out on the street, it was in Athens, Georgia, near the University of Georgia campus. And it was, it was kind of like just jumping into a freezing cold lake. Like I just have to jump now. I just have to approach my first person. And I did. And he gave me $2 for a magazine. It's like, great. I'm a Zendik seller now. And I think selling, selling is interesting because, you know, I was always really good at school. I, there were, there had been things before this that I, I started out being bad at. And I had to work really hard. Like I was in the swim team in grade school. I didn't start out a good swimmer. I had to work really hard to become competent, never mind good at it. And selling was one of those things. I, I was not innately good at it at all. I did, I did learn it. I did get a lot better over time. I developed a degree of consistency, but I, I, never, I never made it into the ranks of the power sellers. And and I, I was always inconsistent. I would have amazing days sometimes, and I would have horrible days. And I never got to the point where I felt like, yep, I know how to go out and have a good day. And on those bad days, it was often spoke about how um, you, it was your, your outward energy that was causing you to have a bad day selling and not the people that you were interacting with it was it was all to do with yeah. what you were outwardly expressing is that right yeah yeah one of the things we would say about selling and about other things but particularly about selling was it's all energy and when you're having a good time and you're quote on then people want to talk to you and they want to hang out with you and they want to buy your stuff and i think there is truth to that 
I did experience that myself, that I would be out selling, I'd be having a terrible time, some internal switch would happen inside me, and suddenly I was doing well. However, that's not the only thing. My husband happens to be a pedicab driver in New York City. Driving a pedicab in New York City, people think of it as being primarily a physical job. You have to be really strong because you're 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 cycling people around, you know, on a tricycle. I've tried it myself, and I would say it's primarily a sales job because the hardest part of of succeeding as a pedicab driver is getting people into your cab. You have to sell those rides. Now, my husband, he's been doing this for many, many years. Sometimes he'll go out and he's like, it's dead tonight. I'm going home. And at Zendik, occasionally we were kind of allowed to blame it on the scene. Like, oh, that was like, that was a bad call. We shouldn't have gone to that spot. But pretty much if you were doing badly, it was your fault. And there's a, there's a few instances in the book where you're sat down with your peers in a circle and they are having this conversation with you saying that you're sabotaging yourself almost. Yeah. Sabotaging myself, sabotaging the trip, just being a drag. Yeah. So at Zendik, it's a lot about a racing competition between each other. But it, it feels surface. as though on the surface, because it feels yeah. as though there is still that element of competition, especially when you would all go out um, selling and at the end you would count up your money and people would be relieved to be the ones that made the most that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was intense competition on the street. And what made it worse was there was both intense competition, like if I was out selling, I, I absolutely, I would have been, I would always have been thrilled to make the most money, which hardly ever happened. But at the very least, I wanted to be kind of in the middle to avoid criticism. So yes, I was intensely aware of how everyone else in the crew was doing. And that was hard enough if I wasn't doing well myself. But what made it worse was this belief that my competitiveness and my jealousy was part of my death culture conditioning. So I'm bad because I'm not making enough money right now. And then I'm doubly bad because I am, because I'm jealous of so-and-so who is doing well. And what I wasn't able to realize was it totally, it made sense to be jealous and to get tense about those things because, because I was kind of in a fight for survival. You know, I was in a, in a fight for, for, for my place in the tribe and for approval and admiration. When you're, when you're out selling, you're selling um, magazines that have people's stories in from the farm? Yeah, in, in the early days of my time at Zendik, our magazines did have a fair number of stories by people who lived at the farm, often you know, the storyline would be something like, I was out in the world and my life was terrible. And then I moved to Zendik and now things are great. There were also screeds by Wolf and Errol, maybe an interview with Errol, essays. I wrote for the magazine a few times. Also um, graphics, artwork, comics. As, as time went by, the number of voices represented in the magazine decreased. And by the time the last issue was published, I believe it was just Errol, Wolf, and Swan in there. And there were no other writers. So then they had a band. When Wolf was alive, he was the band leader. After he died, Errol took over as the band leader and the lead singer. She didn't have any musical training. Some of the other band members did, and they were incredibly talented musicians. Um, And they they kind of carried the music to the extent that it was that it was carried. The music was also all improvised, including the lyrics. And that's very hard to do. So but when but when I lived at the farm, I believed that only Zendik music was pure. So, and I initially, I just didn't like it. I mean, I liked country music, you know, I liked 
music that was had a story to it, you know. Like, I love country music. Yeah. <laughs> and so I listened to the ending music. I'm like, I just don't get this at all. But I really wanted to like it because if I liked it, I could sell more of it. Mm. And over time, through exposure, I I I did develop my more favored tracks and and also every time a new album came out we would have we would gather in the living room to listen to it and and I and I knew that I was supposed to like it and and I was supposed to say something nice to Errol about it and if I didn't that was bad so I sort of I trained myself over time to kind of admire the music um but I never liked it and did you listen to any other radio or was this all seen as part of the death culture? Possibly. I think when we were on road trips, maybe sometimes we listened to the radio in the vehicles. At the farm, I don't remember ever listening to the radio, but we did listen to popular music just, you know, while doing cleanups or cooking meals and, or on work crews. Yeah, there, there, we, we, we did listen to other music. But but it, but there was a very there was a very firm delineation like like this music is crap but we're listening to it because it helps us like get our work done and then this other music is art I mean I mean and it, and well it wasn't that black and white there were some musicians who Errol admired like Nina Simone and Grace Slick and there were there were some approved musicians but still my basic feeling was like Zendik music is pure and everything else is just a little bit dangerous. Okay. Okay. So the music you listen to is not necessarily controlled. Um, is there anything that you felt was controlled sort of food, eating, drinking, what you were allowed to consume, what you weren't allowed to consume? Yeah. Well, just to go back to the, the sort of, media question for a moment we didn't read the newspaper we didn't we weren't getting news on the internet errol read the newspaper but we didn't and we had a library the library was not very inspiring it's possible i could have had access to the library to books from the library but i it, it would have been difficult it wasn't something like hey do you want to you want a library book i couldn't just get books i i hardly read anything when i lived at the farm um as far as other forms of control so eating was an interesting thing at Zendik. we would say on the street that we ate all organic food which was mostly true and it and that was actually a very important way that we distinguished ourselves from the death culture we brought our, all our own food with us when we went on selling trips and also our own water, identifying ourselves as people who only eat organic food then meant that other food that we might encounter when we were off the farm was bad and was impure. I did later find out when I took over the food ordering that some of the things that we were eating were not organic. And I brought this up to Errol. I was shocked. I, I thought this must be a, a terrible mistake that we were eating something that wasn't organic. And she was like, no, just leave it. But um, I mean, the food overall was really good and quite plentiful. It was very high quality food. I, I would say I actually learned to eat better when I lived there. The thing about food though was so much, so much else in my life was not under my control that I just overate like crazy when I lived there because that was like one of the one of the very few things that I could control. The reason I could control it was I was off, I was in charge of the food supply for a lot of the time. And and I mentioned the peanut butter and tahini being controlled substances. At one point in the farm's history, each week every member got a ration of pot and peanut butter. So peanut butter had been controlled for a long time. And in the big walk-in cooler where most of our food was stored, there was a 55 gallon drum in the back corner of this walk-in with a lid on it and a lock. And in that, that barrel was, was kept um, the peanuts, the dates, the raisins, any other dried fruit we had, that, that was kept under lock and key. And this barrel had lots of dents in it and the, the lid was severely bent because 
people had gone in there and like pulled it apart so they could stick their hands in and get a fix of sugar. Who had the key? Sweet. Well, I had, I actually ended up with a lot of the keys because I did a lot of work in the kitchen and over a number of years, a bunch of other women who also had keys left and gave me their keys. And I ended up with like all the keys to the barrel. But then, but then after this, the woman who was in charge of the walk-in left and I took over care of the walk-in and I actually felt like this barrel was really bad. And I, I got permission from Errol to get rid of the barrel and kind of make it so all the food was stored in a way that, that simply made sense. Cause I could, I could feel like all the, all the hiding and the deception that was going into our food supply be, be, because of, because of this lack of individual agency and individual control. And also because there was a hierarchy in relation to food that Errol and her circle got to eat certain things that the rest of us didn't get to eat. Oh, I, that is, I don't think that that's mentioned in the book. No, no. I deliberately de-emphasized food because I didn't want to write another fucking body image memoir. So I left out, I left out most of the food stuff. But. It's interesting because a lot of the, 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 the times where you sit down and you, um, you know, briefly describe what you're eating for that meal, um, mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's rarely ever meat mentioned. So I actually wondered if the farm was vegetarian, but then at some point there is chicken mentioned. Oh yeah. We actually, we used to order entire cows from Warren Wilson, a nearby college with a farm. Yeah. We ate, we ate a lot of meat. I mean, there are ways in which my health improved. I think the quality of the food that I was eating did improve. And I was outdoors doing physical work at least some of the time, but I wasn't necessarily all that healthy. There were there were there were definitely signs my body was giving me that I was actually not in I was not in the best health. Do you think that a lot of that may come from um, maybe not getting as much sleep as you as your body needed? Yeah, I think sleep had sleep had something to do with it, and I think also just being under under constant stress didn't help. One of the the ways that you um, managed to keep order was sorting out the Tupperware. I thought that was a really <laughs> nice um, small detail because I, I, I could envision it really clearly. Um, mm-hmm. So you think that that was something that you did to have maybe just a, a, a small fraction of control over something else that was happening around you? Yeah, absolutely. Being the Tupperware, Tupperware queen of Zendik Farm was one of the ways that I tried to keep my shit together. Yeah, and also I took on that role because I got so irritated when I would be going on a road trip and there'd be a container with the lipid didn't match and even more irritated when it was like one in the morning and someone desperately trying to finish their road prep would come and find me because they knew that I had sort of the concentration card game card game playing mind that could find that could look at the look at the container and know which lid fit and so so I just I didn't want to do that so I was like well I'm gonna I'm gonna take this on and keep this in order and it was just it was just a constant battle that I don't know that I ever won but it's 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 not it's not just you that experiences that I think that Tupperware game is something that happens in almost every household so that must have felt like almost like a level of normalcy to have to have that there was also the tier system with the wristbands at one point as well Mm -hmm. yeah when I when I arrived I kind of noticed these strips of cloth around people's wrists but I just dismissed them I didn't think they meant anything and Later on, I found out that actually they did mean something, that at that time, the farm had an explicit hierarchy of multiple levels. There was the family at the top. They had purple wristbands. The family, capital F, meaning Errol and her inner circle. Then the family apprentices on the level below, gray, they were supposed to be quickly evolving and on their way possibly to being in the family. Then there were the core members, Royal Blue, they'd been around for a couple of years. They were considered solid and dependable. Core apprentices, Brown, 
been there for less time, but on their way to being in the core. The Zendik apprentices, green at the bottom, that's what I became when I chose to stay. And then the family warriors with pink wristbands over on the side of the evolutionary pyramid. They've been around for a while, but they weren't really evolving. You've, you've gone to the farm. You plan to only stay for a couple of weeks. Yeah, that was, that was my default plan. I didn't, I didn't expect that I was going to stay. I was open to the idea that I might, but it seems unlikely considering my pattern of visiting various other places and leaving fairly quickly. Do you think that the, the wristband sort of in, incentivized you to stay? No, it was the opposite. I didn't find out about the wristbands until after I had given the Zendix all my money. And I was actually really upset when I found out about them because I felt like I had spent my entire life in school being rated and ranked and numerically valued. And I thought that at Zendik it was going to be different. And when I found out that it wasn't, there, there was this ladder I had to climb, I was really shocked and really upset. But it was too late. I wasn't getting my money back. And so I kind of had to find a way to make it make sense. And the woman who told me about the wristbands after I asked her, who admitted that they were there and, and told me a bit about them, she said that it wasn't actually a hierarchy, that it was my competitive conditioning that made me see it that way. But really, it was just that some people understood the philosophy better and took more responsibility. The, the wristband thing, when, when I read that part of the book, it definitely felt like it came across like that was actually encouraging competition within the mm-hmm. farm. They can say that they're, that, that, that they're trying to eradicate competition, but why, why do you think that it was being, even if it's subconsciously encouraged to actually continue to be competitive and say that you're not being competitive? Well, it's an excellent mind fuck, isn't it? Just a great way to keep people off balance. Under the surface, I would say what we were actually competing for was Errol's approval. And that was limited. And she already had a daughter, you know, and none of us women was ever going to rise to that level in her affections. But as long as we were striving to do so, we were going to be working hard and making money and building those rock walls. So she was a very, very clever woman, Errol. Yes, I would say that she was, she was very, she was a very skilled manipulator. She had, she had good social skills. She knew how to read people. She had grown up in the projects in Brooklyn and Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. Well, she, it, it, was, it was pretty rough there. And she had to learn from a young age how to take care of herself and protect herself. Yeah, protect herself from a, from a position of, of weakness. So I think she had, she had really excellent instincts for um, people's, people's weak spots. And then she was um, she was working on um, a movie set. Is that right? And she met Wolf, and he had this philosophy. And there was something about she turned down a, a, a role in a new TV show in order to go away with him. So on the on the farm, um, you've got the the, the band, um, and you've got some people who get to write. Um, at least part of their creation stories that are in the magazines. Um, what other types of art are available at the farm for people to take part in? One woman was really good at making stained glass. Swan had the dance studio that she. Yes, made. that's right. That's right. She had the she had the dance studio, and there other Zendix would sometimes dance with her and be part of performances and dance videos. There was also a comedy troupe. They did improv comedy performances, and sometimes they would have kind of classes for everyone else, and we would all gather in the dance room and play improv games. That was actually really fun. There, there, was, a, there was a fair amount of graphic art. Errol's boyfriend 
was a painter. He did lots of painting. Other people drew. There was designing the magazine, making the graphics for the CD covers. And also there was this concept that Wolf had come up with of life artistry, which was kind of a convenient way to get people to forget about their desire to do art. Because that idea was that anything you do can be art, even digging an outhouse hole. And that's kind of true because digging an outhouse hole is actually a very, it's a complex process. You can do well or you can do poorly. You're probably not really going to feel like you fully expressed yourself after digging an outhouse hole the way you might feel it once you, you know, finish writing a book or composing a piece of music. I mean, something interesting about my past path as art was when I was in college, I, I mostly made things in three dimensions, like installations. And I often used like mass produced materials like balloons or trash bags or toilet paper or chewing gum. And and towards the end of my time in school, it dawned on me that all these things I made that were, they were beautiful, but when their time was up, the maintenance men in the visual arts building would come through with their dumpsters and take it all to the landfill. And I had, I, I had in, in, the, in the summer times during college, I worked at a resort in the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho. And I was so struck by the beauty of that place. And, and towards the end of my time in college, I put together the fact that there was human created beauty, which often ended up in a landfill. And there was natural beauty, which was unmatchable. So in a way, when I left college, I was sort of done with visual art in the way I had been doing it. I didn't want to fill up dumpsters anymore. And so I didn't really miss doing that kind of thing. Although I did eventually bring my professional grade balloon inflator to the farm. And I, and I did once do an experiment sort of mini art project involving fishing line. But I was kind of okay with being done with that part of it. What, what really mattered to me, though, as an artist, and I think something that had always really mattered to me, but I hadn't known how to deal with it, was writing. At Zendik, I did have, like I said, something published in the magazine, but I was mostly just shoving tiny bouts of writing into the interstices of my very busy days, just, you know, half an hour here or whatever, or late at night or something. And, and in the same way that Zendik was all about the improvised music, it was also all about not necessarily improvised writing, but about like the first draft. And if you were really honest, your writing was going to be good. And if you were not being honest, it was going to be bad. So there wasn't much room for really developing the craft of writing. And Errol was my primary reader and my only editor. She was the one who decided if what I wrote was good or not. And she didn't really know much about writing. So I didn't, I did get to write. And some of the things that I wrote when I lived there, I would say are kind of okay, but I didn't get to develop as a writer. And were you always hoping that the stuff that you were writing would be enough to you more to Errol, make, make you sort of noticed by her? Yeah, I mean, that's, that was one of the most exciting things that could happen to me at Zendik was that I would write something that Errol would like and she'd want to publish in the magazine or want me to read it aloud to the group at lunchtime or something. Yeah. Um, and was it was it often that you would sit down and discuss things in in groups with the whole farm present? Oh, um, yeah, we had a we had a number of different kinds of full group meetings. There were living therapy meetings. Living therapy was our form of well, we called it our form of psychotherapy. I don't know if that's accurate or, at all or not, but it was the idea that. If you go to a, a, a therapist out in the world, you spend 50 minutes a week talking about your problems, whereas at Zendik, therapy can be constant. 
you know, we're, we're, we're always being honest with each other all the time, but at a living therapy meeting, you could raise your hand and bring up something that you felt was a problem about yourself, or more often you could bring up something that was a problem with someone else. And then the rest of the group would weigh in on it. That could be very painful for the person being brought up. There were also sex meetings where we talked about sex. The usual pattern in those meetings was that someone would ask a question or present a frustration they were having in terms of sexuality. And one, or one of the higher ups would weigh in on that, give advice. Maybe other people would, would check in too. And, and then there were other, you know, there were other times when there were just impromptu meetings, like something big happened, everybody to the farmhouse now. And, and then we had logistical meetings, like we had selling meetings to figure out who was going to go on which trip. With these group talks, were they something that you adjusted to and, and got used to, or were they always something that felt uncomfortable and just not, not natural? Well, when I first arrived, I, I was really eager to evolve and get input. Input was this term for our term for criticism. I really wanted someone to bring me up at a living therapy meeting. Because to me, that meant I was being noticed. It meant people cared enough to, to, to pay attention to how I was fucking up. So that was my experience in the beginning. As I would say, often when these meetings happened, I, I would feel a measure of excitement because something interesting could come up. Or maybe I had a problem that I wanted to present to the group and I and I expected to get a good answer that was really going to move me forward. Of course, the couple times the meeting, well, might have been more than a couple times, but the times when the meeting was about me, those were just that those were just times of pure dread. You know, that was that was just in, incredibly rough. And there's a there's a, a point in one of these meetings where um your your name is called out and you are you are spoken about by several members of the group who um accuse you of being um competitive um and 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 being the reason for the the selling trips being unsuccessful um and I think then then it mentions that you you began crying but you were saying that you were sorry but actually in your head you knew that they were tears of anger and you were angry at this position of of not having any power at this moment. Well, I think at the time it happened I didn't know I was angry. I was just involuntarily crying because that was the only thing I could do. And it was only later I didn't actually crack the code of my crying until after I left Zendik. When I lived at Zendik, I cried uncontrollably so many times. And, and I make a distinction between those, those tears of rage and helplessness and the tears of grief and sorrow. But after I left the farm, well, it wasn't really after I left the farm. It was after I, well, after I mentally, emotionally fully liberated myself from the farm. I just stopped crying in that way. And that's, that's how I knew how to decipher those crying bouts I had at the farm. So I was no longer helpless and I didn't cry that way. And that enabled me to understand what I was doing. And that turned out to be really useful to me just in my, in my life as a whole to, to understand what that kind of crying means. Because since leaving Zendik, I have had other experiences of crying in that way. And I know that when I'm crying in that way, I have surrendered my sovereignty in some way. And I had better find out what that is. And, and often when something is really bugging me and I've done something to betray myself, I know, or just when something's wrong, I know that I will know that the problem has been solved when I stop crying. It's really great that you're able to distinguish those things now and realize that when the problem is sorted, you will be able to stop crying and, and, and not feel this dread anymore. 
Um, I think we should probably stop there for today and maybe pick up again uh, next week and continue our story. Thank you so much, Helen, for joining me this week. I'm really looking forward to catching up with you again next week where we can continue to talk a little bit more about your experience and your time living on the Zendik farm. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been a a wonderful, wide-ranging conversation. Join us again next week where we will be finishing up Helen's story. You can find her book titled Mating in Captivity on Amazon and iBooks. You can also visit Helen's website, www.helenzuman.com, to find out more about the author. In July, I will be releasing a two-part exclusive on the Armshin Rikyo cult for Patreons only, so sign up if you would like access to this content. If you are in a cult or know someone who might be, please use the link in the description for advice and support. If you would like to get in touch, you can email me at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or find me on Twitter and Instagram at cultvaultpod. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Casey, and this is The Cult Vault. Cult Vault.